I'm back in London the last couple of days for a meeting here at the Royal College of Physicians in the centre of London by Regent's Park. The Royal College of Physicians has the most amazing medicinal garden. Here you can see plants ranging from Valeriana across to many others, pomegranate tree here, Atropionia, uh, Belladonna, beautifully well maintained gardens thanks to the Wolfson collection here. It made me think a couple of things. I mean, it's 22, 23 years now since I left London for Edinburgh and moved up in August 2001, started working in the Edinburgh IBD unit in August 2003. And here with the medicinal garden here and thinking about medicines and what's changed in that time, the, the story of medicines for inflammatory bowel disease is fascinating. I mean, steroids since the 1950s, sulfazalazine and mesalazine and since the 1980s, thiopurines, the first documented use in the late 1960s. And then you can fast forward to the mid-late 1990s, 1993, when the team at the AMC dosed the first patient with Crohn's disease, a 13-year-old girl, with infliximab, the, the CA2 um, the, from Sensacore, that first molecule that became Remicade years later. And so there we were in 2003 when I started in the Edinburgh IBD unit treating patients with Crohn's disease, with infliximab, but not doing it very well, treating them late in their disease course, using the drug episodically, often as monotherapy, so patients develop antibodies against the brain fragment. But boy, what a change we've seen over 20 years. We've seen our medicines evolve. We got Adalimab, a more humanized, supposedly fully humanized monoclonal antibody to anti-TNF. We learned how to use the anti-TNF drugs properly. Multiple data sets showing that we should use them early in the disease course. We should use them often as combination therapy. We should just keep the drugs going, induce and maintain. We worked out about dosing, the pros and cons of therapeutic drug monitoring, etc. And then we moved into the sort of middle biologic era with vedalizumab, still very, very useful in our clinic, patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Ten years now of vedalizumab, um, ustekinumab, of course, then moving into the small molecule era with the first generation JAK inhibitor, tofacitinib, now upalacitinib and filgotinib, transforming acute use in ulcerative colitis and, of course, for the maintenance as well, and upalacitinib for tricky Crohn's disease patients. The new biologic era now with the P19s transforming care for Crohn's disease and now ulcerative colitis, the three of them, you know, risenkizumab, gazelkumab, and mirakizumab, and moving forwards, you know, we've got the great excitement about the tier one A's, three big pharma companies all competing there, probably four actually, if you look at that space. We've got new antibody technologies coming on board. You can look at what Spire Therapeutics are doing, absolutely fascinating, generating antibodies against all these key targets with very long half-lives and looking at a really ambitious, fantastic combination strategy combining the different molecules. Of course, we've got J&J doing that with Gazelkumab and Golimumab, the duet studies reporting this year. AbbVie are doing the same with platform studies and many others too. A rich phase two pipeline and then huge interest in what we can do with the microbiome, which kind of brings me back to the roots of where we're at, thinking back to, you know, medicines in the ground here, growing in these botanical gardens here at the Royal College of Physicians, thinking to, to, to food as medicine as well. And a lot of different aspects here, but a lot of things that really work, evidence-based medicines that we're using in the clinic today, clinical trials that are transforming practice and outcomes for patients that I have absolutely no doubt are transformative compared to where they were 20 years ago. Fewer hospitalizations, fewer surgeries, better quality of life to say the least and hopefully in the near distant future moving towards medicines where they're given much less frequently, where they are truly persisting with minimal, if any, safety concern and monitoring constraints, switching off the disease for the long term. So that feels like a pretty optimistic point to lean it on. Flying back to Edinburgh tonight, back to the clinic, 
looking forward to catching up with what's going on there. So goodbye from a glorious sunny day in London.